What is going on Gecko guys and gals? Beautiful day in the neighborhood and today we are going to talk about what we learned about poking holes in your incubation tubs this breeding season for leopard geckos. Selling in the billions each year, Rainbow Mealworms is your one-stop shop for all your insect needs. Their quality feeders and A-plus customer service keep me coming back to support the health and growth of all of our animals. Visit them today at rainbowmealworms.net to place your order. Now, in case you didn't know, what we experienced at the beginning of this breeding season was we lost about 12 to 14 babies. I did not count the exact amount. The really surprising part was that the first few clutches of the season were perfectly fine. So I had no inclination that anything was wrong. Then at about clutches four onwards for the next 14 babies, we started encountering a lot of stillborn babies, babies that would hatch out of the egg or maybe halfway hatch out of the egg and die. So babies that hatch out and die right away, I kind of call those stillborns. And then babies that die in the egg, I kind of call those stillborns as well. But we were also encountering babies that were hatching out with their yolk sacs still attached, which does happen, but is a little bit more on the rare side. But we were seeing a handful of babies with that issue as well. And then lastly, what really cued me on was that we were having babies that were fully hatched out of the egg and they were dying in the incubator cup less than 24 hours after hatching because I check my eggs every single day. So it's 24 hours before I check eggs the next day. And that is very, very rare for that to happen. That's never happened to me in three breeding seasons prior. Babies are usually very, very good at living in their incubation cups for even three days or longer sometimes in certain cases where you can't get to the babies for that period of time. And the babies that died in this condition, they seemed a little bit shriveled and dried up and that made the light bulb go off in my head to say that they kind of look like they were suffocating a little bit. So I began to think about what did I do differently from this breeding season compared to last breeding season. This breeding season, we are scheduled to hatch a few hundred babies, whereas last breeding season, we were scheduled to hatch a few dozen babies. So the strategy kind of changed. If you watch our old incubation video, you'll see that we used to incubate our eggs in little Tupperware containers with no holes inside of those containers. And we dedicated each container to one female. And every two weeks when that female laid a new clutch, we would open that container and put the new eggs in. That is a very, very inefficient way to breed leopard geckos if you were doing this on mass scale. We're talking hundreds of babies, possibly leading into the thousands. Because if eggs go bad, they get moldy and the mold is going to spread very quickly if you don't get rid of those eggs right away. And to remove those eggs, from every single container of hundreds of containers would be very, very time consuming and just not an efficient use of time. In addition to that, every single time a girl lays, it's an extra step in the process. You have to go find her container, come back to the room, put her eggs in the container, drop it off in the incubator and do that for every single female. So what we started doing is something that a lot of bigger breeders do, which is they will use small little deli cups like this to incubate the eggs. Well, like I said, the first few clutches were no problem. And so I didn't think nothing of it. But when babies started dying, I started asking around some breeders. One of those breeders is none other than Ron Tremper himself. If you know anything about Ron Tremper, me and my cousin joke about him being the godfather of leopard geckos. Thought I'd come out though. Because he did so much for promoting leopard geckos. He has an albino line named after him, the Tremper albino. And he also did a lot of data and research and documentation when it came to his leopard gecko operation. So he has multiple books, electronic books that are out. So check him out at his website, leopardgecko.com. He even owns the name leopardgecko.com. Isn't that amazing? So I look up to him a lot. I think he's a really, really cool guy. 
and he's done a ton for the leopard gecko industry and marketing leopard geckos. So I reached out to him as well as many other people, but his exact words to me, I'll show you on screen here if I get the chance. He said that holes in the incubation tubs are absolutely necessary and he recommends using eight ounce incubation plastic tubs. Now, just so that you get a reference, this is an eight ounce tub. This is a 3.25 ounce tub. There is a drastic difference. And two babies can hatch out in here and still have plenty of room. Some people use even smaller compartments than this, but personally, I don't want the babies crowding each other too much. And so 3.25 ounces is just fine. But he recommended an eight ounce, which is gigantic. This would be like a mansion for babies to be hatching in. So you don't have to do everything exactly the same as other people. Everyone finds their own method and way, but I really, really wanted to stick with this size. So I started doing a little bit of research for other breeders that use that size. I saw a bunch of other breeders and what they would do is they would poke pinholes in the container. So what that would look like is after you were done putting your vermiculite in or before, you would poke one, two, three, four, five, six. Ron Tremper recommended using pin size holes and he recommended six to eight holes. Mind you, he was also recommending a bigger incubation tub, but I was looking at a lot of people and they did not use bigger incubation tubs. I had this one idea. I said, what if I use a hole puncher? So I started looking for people that might use hole punchers. And there are some people that punch a hole in the lid, boom, right there like Hunter Manley of Manley's Geckos. And that made me think, okay, so he's on to the same idea as me. This is a 1 8 inch hole puncher and he would punch one hole in the lid. Now I don't like punching a hole in the lid because I stack my tubs in the incubator. So let me, let me show you what they look like real quick. Okay, so you can kind of see the way that we stack our eggs here. I started using these little trays from the dollar store because they're perfect for holding a couple layers of incubation tubs. So let me show you what I do here. So all of these are too deep. You can see this one little tub holds two of these incubation containers. And you can see all these eggs are doing great, doing wonderful. And then once a tub is full, I will stack the other tub on top of it and they stack really, really well. I have to make a new tub for that. I ran out of space yesterday. So gotta figure out that problem later. And there's just one more shot of all these eggs incubating. And you could fit a lot of eggs in a small amount of area doing it that way. So I was like, okay, I got my method, I'm good to go. But I wanted to do a little bit more research because it just didn't really quite make sense to me that babies would be dying from lack of oxygen in those little containers. So I was looking at another big breeder that I know Gary Orner of Orner's Exotics. And if you look at his Instagram feed, by the way, there's a tip for learning about how people keep their animals. Scroll through their Instagram feed, YouTube videos, TikTok, Facebook, whatever they have, and you can see little tips and tricks of the way that they do things, because oftentimes people mention it. And I noticed that he used the same size containers as me, or very close, the 3.25 ounce containers, or it was very close. The way I could tell is because the size of the babies in the container, I could tell it was, I know what that looks like. And so I could tell he was using the same size containers that I was pretty much. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, just a quick question that I wanna throw your way. Do you poke air holes in your containers and what's your experience with that? He's been breeding leopard geckos for dozens of years, so he has a lot of experience. He does not poke holes in his containers and he has no issues. And to my knowledge, he is not airing out those containers. If you're airing out the containers and exchanging it with fresh oxygen, that's a different story. But again, you can't do that with thousands of containers. It's just not an efficient use of time, nor would it even be possible, I don't think. So let's just assume that he is not burping his containers or letting new air in. He told me that he does not punch any holes in his containers and he's never had any deaths. He has very little amount of stillborns. He has a great operation running. So I said, okay, why would that make a difference? I believe he's in the Chicago area, so you could fact check me and double check that. But in areas of colder temperature, I'm in Arizona, so it's very warm here, elevation and oxygen density might make a difference. And that's one theory that I have. It's not 
the strongest theory because I'm not a geologist or weatherologist or like I don't really know the facts behind whether that's a possibility but it is an idea that went through my head is he's at a higher elevation with a colder temperature maybe it's possible that the oxygen density is more so when he seals that container that more oxygen molecules are stuck in that container and allow the babies to survive for 60 days or 80 days, whatever it is, their full term of incubation. Another theory obviously is that the lids don't close as tight. However, he is using deli cups and deli cups are used in the restaurant industry to pretty much be airtight. I don't know any deli cups that are not airtight. It's a snap on lid. Look, hear that? It's a snap on lid. It snaps on to be airtight because it's meant to hold ketchup and other liquids and stuff like that, that people are leaving restaurants with. So if you have any other theories of what it could be, please drop a comment in the comments below because I'm still searching for theories of what it might be. But here's what we do. And this is also gonna be a great demonstration for how to set up your little incubation tub. So I just turned on my scale right now. You can buy these from Amazon. They're like 20 bucks or something. They're just called a, like a food gram scale. And you don't need one that holds very much poundage. You know, maximum you're gonna need on this is a pound, maybe five pounds if you want, get whatever size you want. But what I do is I take my 1 8 inch hole puncher and there's usually a little metal frame that I had to rip off so that it doesn't bend this plastic and now it's perfect. I tried to do it with another one. It actually like broke the spring in here and then wound up making the handle like stretch even more and be uncomfortable. But thankfully that didn't happen with this one. So just be a little careful. You'll know what I'm talking about. If you buy this, it's a 1 8 inch hole puncher from Amazon. You tear off the little metal piece. That's kind of like a spring metal piece and it allows you to do this very well. I punch a hole right near the top. The puncher part, that part, is on the outside of the tub. It makes it easier for pull away. Punch, open, pull away. Boom. Now you have a perfect size hole. I was also wondering how many holes I should punch because you don't want the vermiculite or whatever substrate you're using to evaporate or dry out too much, especially if you have a male incubation tub. So I found Enzo's geckos on YouTube. He used eight ounce deli cups like this that have like five eighth inch, which is this size holes in it. And I was like, okay, I should be perfectly fine with two holes then. Cause I really like the idea of airflow right if you just have one hole it's still like a vacuum a little bit only a little air is trickling in but if you have two holes air is flowing through the container and doing really really good the problem that i encountered with that was i was trying to skimp on substrate just so you can see how this is done when i weigh this cup it's going to weigh like 2.8 grams you hit the tear button and now it's zeroed out and i was trying to use like very little amount of vermiculite because I wanted to save vermiculite because we have a lot of eggs. And that worked. If the eggs are really, really healthy and great, one or two ounces of vermiculite and then the same amount of water is going to work just fine. But what I was encountering was I was getting a lot of eggs that were drying out and denting. And I was just wondering if maybe it was too much airflow or too little amount of water and substrate. So what I'm experimenting with right now that I really, really like is I'm using about three to four grams of actual substrate. So this is four grams of actual vermiculite. And then I'm doing a one to three ratio. So I'm actually using three parts of water for every one part of vermiculite. And I only punch one hole in the container now. Over the course of 30 to 60 days, however long the babies are incubating, to me, it holds better humidity. So, so far I'm liking it the best. All right, so what you'll do is you'll take your little sprayer. So this is negative 2.8 right now. That's the weight of an empty cup. So that's telling me that actual vermiculite in here is four grams. All you gotta do is multiply that by three to get a one to three ratio. So four times three is 12. So what we wanna see is 12 grams on here. Boom, 13 grams, that's perfectly fine. I've been going over a little bit, sometimes using a one to four ratio and it's perfectly fine. See, you snap that lid shut, shake it around. And then what I like to do is 
compress this down. See the substrate is kind of crumbly, but it's not soaking wet. So it should not be soaking wet, but it should be crumbly and that will hold enough moisture in here for the full 30 to 60 days term. But what I like to do is press it down so it's firm and then make a little divot with my finger for one egg and then a little divot with my finger for the other egg. You also could just shimmy the egg in there to make the divot, but if you compact that very tightly and you have like a soft, weak egg, you might accidentally rip the egg by the friction that you are burying it with. So it's good to just kind of use your finger to get in there and then plop the two eggs in there and then you can just kind of pack it down around the eggs. Then you'll seal this, you'll write all the information that you record onto the top and then take it right into the incubator. Now before I did things that way with the hole puncher, I did Ron Tremper's method of experimenting with four pinholes to six pinholes was the amount of pinholes I was experimenting with. Both of those worked well. Four pinholes is good enough for air to get in there. And we did not lose any babies using four pinholes. We also did not lose any babies using six pinholes. The only problem with more pinholes than less pinholes is again, the evaporation of the substrate level. But if you're using a one to two ratio or one to three ratio of water to vermiculite, that should not be an issue. Even a one to one ratio, as long as you're using like three grams of vermiculite to four grams, a one to one ratio should be fine. If you're using one to two grams of vermiculite, like I was trying to do to get away with skimping it, that might evaporate a little bit quickly because there's less moisture, less compactness, and it's gonna evaporate very quickly. So if you think to yourself, what evaporates quicker, shallow soil or deep soil? Shallow soil evaporates quicker because the sun can penetrate it easier, the air can penetrate it easier, and it evaporates. But deep soil does not evaporate so easily because it's so compact that the air cannot penetrate it as well as the shallow soil. So keep that same principle in mind for incubating eggs. In my opinion, it's better to go a little bit deeper in those 3.25 ounce cups I would use three to four grams of substrate. If you're looking at it compacted, it comes to about two centimeters, so half an inch. So I would use at minimum for leopard gecko eggs, half an inch of substrate, whether you're using perlite, vermiculite, soil, eco earth, sphagnum moss, whatever you're doing, because that will allow maximum retention of water. Now you can use more of course, but uh, when you're working with thousands of, of eggs, you're trying not to waste as much as possible, right? So that's my problem. But if you don't have that problem, more will be better than less in this case. Now, although I did like the pinholes, it's very time consuming to punch pinholes in thousands of tubs compared to just taking my little boop, puncher thing here and punching one hole in it. So that's the reason why I like the puncher. Plus it just seems funner to do the puncher than the pinholes. And the pinholes, you always risk kind of bending and breaking the plastic because every time you punch in the pinhole and pull it out, your hand might squeeze the plastic. So I like the 1 8 inch hole puncher better. Now for the good news. Since punching holes in our tubs, whatever method you choose, whether it's pinholes or whether it's the hole puncher, as long as your substrate is not evaporating since doing that we've had a hundred percent success rate with babies hatching and not suffocating so of course babies still come out with issues every now and then and a baby will die every now and then but it should not have been 14 babies in a row and that all happened in the course of like two to three days right so on day one I lost a couple babies and I was like oh that's so sad but it happens on day two I lost a couple more babies and I was like, huh, this is interesting, you know, but nothing completely out of the ordinary. Like this is a little rare, but it's not that it's impossible to happen. And then on day three, when I lost like 10 babies in a row on day three, I was like, okay, something is wrong. I need to reassess, reanalyze, regroup here and figure out what is going on. And so that's when I came up with the oxygen issue. Whether you want to listen to me about the oxygen issue or not, I can tell you this. We hatched out a couple successful babies at the beginning of our season. And then we lost like 14 babies shortly after that. And they were all mixed genetics. So some of it was 
wild type. Some of it was lemon frost. Some of it was bold. Some of it was tangerine. It was all mixed. So you can't say that it was because of a certain genetic, which is my thinking about why I thought that it might be the oxygen level. If it was all like lemon frost or all tangerine, then you might be able to chalk it up to bad genetic line. But mixed genetics like that equally, something was wrong. And the real kicker is this. As soon as I punch holes in the tub, all the babies start hatching out alive. So take that for what it's worth. It's not 100% proof that it was an oxygen issue, but it is a very, very good inference. Okay, all the babies are dying and suffocating. We punch holes, all the babies are alive, and we have not encountered that issue since. By the way, it took me like a couple hours to punch holes in the rest of the tubs, but I thought the sacrifice was worth it, and obviously it was worth it because we have found success. So take that for what it's worth. You don't have to listen to me about punching holes in the containers. You might be perfectly fine not punching holes in your containers. All I'm saying is air quality and air density is different in different locations. And for us in Arizona, in our operation, the way that we incubate our eggs in the 3.25 ounce cups, it seems that oxygen matters. So what did you think about this video, guys? You kind of got a two for one. One, you got to learn that oxygen matters for incubation tubs. And two, you got to see our most recent way of how we incubate our leopard gecko eggs. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and also recommend some other topics that we can talk about for you. So until next time, my friends, stay passionate, take care of your animals, and have a geeky gecko great day. Peace.